Friends, let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, and prepare our hearts to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may discern your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. Friends, listen for the word of God. Then God said, Let us make humanity in our image to resemble us, so that they may take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and all the crawling things on earth. God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and master it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and everything crawling on the ground. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before any field crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into the human's nostrils. The human came to life. Friends, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On uh, Wednesday of this past week, Beth and I attended a gathering of clergy in downtown Buffalo on the steps of City Hall. We were there along with other members of the, the clergy in our community as part of the uh, protest to the events that occurred in our country recently. This uh, series of racist events that culminated in the death in Minneapolis of a man named George Floyd, a man who was lynched, essentially, by the police in broad daylight in front of a camera. But that wasn't the only thing that brought us there. There were several others as well. You may recall the uh, case of Ahmaud Arbery. Mr. Arbery was jogging in a predominantly white neighborhood uh, where one morning back a couple of months ago uh, he was chased down by a couple of people from that neighborhood in a truck. He was accosted, he was assaulted, and ultimately shot and killed. Or you may remember Breonna Taylor. She was sleeping in her home, in bed with her partner, when the police burst into her home unannounced, and her partner, thinking it was a break-in, grabbed a gun he had nearby and began to shoot. The police shot back. Breonna was killed. Her partner injured. 
Or perhaps you heard about the incident at uh, Central Park in New York City where uh, a man named Christian Cooper, an African-American man, was uh, in the park to do some bird watching, a favorite hobby of his, uh, when he found, came across a woman who had a, a dog, the dog was off its leash, and that's against the park rules. So Mr. Cooper asked her to put her dog on the leash, and she became offended, and uh, it led to a uh, bit of a uh, confrontation, in which she threatened to call the police, in fact did call the police, announcing that she was being threatened by an African-American man in the park, and she was frightened for her life. Uh, microaggression, some might call that. I think that's actually a bigger aggression than micro. Uh, <clears throat> all of this was captured on uh, Mr. Cooper's camera. I think he was a bit astonished by this woman's reaction. And then, of course, finally, the terrible incident in Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed, as I say, lynched by police officers there in Minneapolis. You know, all of those are kind of different circumstances, some caused by average citizens, others caused by police, but all of them are rooted in the same problem. You know, we've been living these past months under a lot of anxiety in our country. And anxiety has a tendency to make us sort of go back to the things we feel are most familiar in our lives. Uh, and as soon as things started to reopen in our communities, it seems one of the most familiar things for us in this country is racism. When anxiety goes up, so does incidents of racism in our country. Because that seems to be uh, part of our DNA in this society. And I think that's partly why we have experienced so much outrage in the past week and a half or so from people not just uh, in Minneapolis over George Floyd's death, but across the country and even in the world. Outrage and anger and frustration, sometimes uh, expressed in violent ways over this terrible legacy that we carry. It is for us a 400 year legacy. In 1619, the first enslaved Africans were brought to this country, brought to provide labor, forced labor, to grow the crops that colonists would eat, to grow, produce the fibers that would be used to make clothing for those colonists and to trade in the market of the world, to build the homes in which they would live, the institutions from which they would govern and learn. African people brought to this country as slaves 400 years ago. And that legacy has led to the establishment of racism as a foundational principle in our country. You see, racism is the product of enslavement. It's not the other way around. Racism is, is a worldview that was created to justify enslaving those who were from Africa. A justification that was invented in about the 1400s, about 1450 or so, uh, through the work of Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, 
who sort of began this whole project in our world. Up to that point, there had been slaves, always there have been slaves in the world, but it wasn't based on uh, a skin color in particular. Europeans were enslaved, uh, Africans were enslaved, Asians were enslaved, uh, but this uh, hierarchy of racial color, of skin color determining a person's status within society, that was an invention. Just as race is an invention, this idea that there is something fundamentally different in a person whose skin color happens to be darker than a white person's skin color. That's an invention that has no basis in biology or in fact, but has been created as a way of, of in justifying this system of slavery that was brought into being and brought to the shores of this country 400 years ago. We have continued to hold on to that idea. Even though slavery itself has been abolished, we continue to practice it through Jim Crow. And today, we see it being practiced through mass incarceration. Black bodies in this country are devalued. They are treated as inferior because of the color of their skin. The, literally, the most superficial reason imagined. You may have noticed, if you've been by the church recently, that our sign now bears the words, the slogan, Black Lives Matter. Some people may take offense at that. Uh, sometimes white folks see that or hear it and feel that they are being attacked. Those words aren't meant to be provocative. Those words are meant, I think, to provide a reminder. A reminder that uh, white people in this country need to hear from time to time because we have spent so many years, so many hundreds of years, uh, in the belief that black lives do not matter, that they are expendable, that they are meant to serve white lives somehow. So that's why that sign is there right now. It's why uh, I was on the steps of City Hall on Wednesday, along with Beth and many other clergy in our community. People who are tired of this outrage. I read to you two stories from Genesis. Two stories of creation. Now, these stories are not in competition with one another. They're, in fact, complementary to one another. In both of them, we learn of human origin, where we come from. In the first, which actually is not the earlier story, in, in fact, chronologically, the, the second story is probably earlier in the uh, history of storytelling, but in that first story, we're told that God determined to create humanity in God's image. In God's image. And in the second, we discover how that's done when God takes the topsoil and fashions a human and then whew, breathes life into the human's nostrils. Yesterday, or rather on Wednesday, one of the uh, chants was, same mud, same blood. That is, we are all the same, made of the same earth. We all have infused in us the same breath of life from God. So what does it mean to be created in God's image, to be made in God's image? Does it mean that we look like God, 
or that somehow God looks like us? Well, I don't think so, really. Uh, <clears throat> too often, uh, that sort of literal interpretation has meant that not only does God look like us, but God must also think like us. And so uh, we actually end up turning the tables, and God is created in our image instead of our being created in God's. I think that being created in God's image isn't about our physical attributes. It's about our more intrinsic qualities, our capacity for love, for compassion, for a desire for justice. Because those are attributes that God holds over and over. In Hebrew scriptures, we hear of God being described as full of mercy and abounding in steadfast love. This is who God is for the Israelites, and these are the qualities that God infuses into humanity. God's image that we carry within us. It has nothing to do with our physical appearance. Because as we know, skin, skin color, that's the result of evolution. Our ancestors 100,000 years ago or more made their way out of Africa to migrate further into the world. And in doing that, in leaving behind the climate and the environment of Africa, their appearance began to evolve, to allow them to survive better in this new environment where the sun isn't quite as uh, strong, where it is perhaps in, uh, in ex you're exposed to it for a less time. Skin became lighter as pigment began to uh, become more uh, suppressed in our bodies. It's evolution, how we look. But who we are, those qualities of compassion, mercy, love, those are part of our creation. Our capacity to be like God in that sense is our birthright. And it's one we share with every other human on the planet. It's what draws us to one another. It's why when we have seen the treatment of people like George Floyd and Christian Cooper, to see that treatment and realize that to regard another person with such blatant dismissal is just not right. It is a violation, a violation of God's image present in those people, present in each one of us. When your stomach tightens up because you see another person suffering, that's your connection with them that is breathed into you. The breath of life, the image of God crying out in you to the other, seeking to make a connection and provide care to help, to offer justice. You see, racism is a sin that violates that image. But because we created it, we can also eradicate it. We are not bound to live 
this way with one another. We have the capacity within ourselves to change. We can reach out beyond ourselves and do the work that's necessary to bring equity and justice to people of color in our community, in our society, and in the world. It begins with establishing new relationships, finding ways to reach out and become friends with people of color around us. A study was done not too long, long ago in the area of Buffalo that found 90% of the population in the Buffalo area lives in racial isolation. That is, 90% of the population in our area have no meaningful relationship with another person of color. That's hard to imagine. And yet, as you know, most of the people whom you may know in your life who are black, uh, probably you know them from the supermarket or from the bank or you know, in some kind of transactional relationship with them. That has to change. We have to find ways of developing friendships, real relationships, to learn from one another, to find ways of making a connection so that the image of God in us can reach out to the image of God in the other and establish the kind of compassion and justice and equity that God intends us all to enjoy. I encourage you in particular to read this book. This is how to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. It's a brilliant book. He's a brilliant writer. And if you see anything on YouTube uh, of a talk or lecture that he's giving, I encourage you, jump on it. Watch, listen, learn. He has much to teach us. And find ways within our community here to reach out, to get to know people of color around you. It's important for each of us as individuals, but it's important too for us as a church. Because the church needs to repent. We need to repent of our racism so that we can begin to build bridges of tolerance, of love, of understanding, of value with one another. We've sat silently for too long. We've joined in the justification of white superiority, white supremacy. It's time we let go of that worldview and begin to reach out and live out of this image we are created with. The image of God for we all are made in that image. And to violate it is a sin, not just against the individual, but against God, against our very nature. Friends, I encourage you to find ways to befriend and to walk alongside people of color. Join in the struggle that we are a part of for racial justice, for racial equity, for compassion, and for love. All of which can finally lead to peace. Amen. I invite you to join in an affirmation of faith this affirmation is taken from the Confession of Belhar. The Confession of Belhar was created in South Africa during apartheid. It is the first confession in our collection of confessional statements in the denomination. 
uh, that is from a country that is non-European. Uh, it is a testament to the need for justice among people who are separated because of race. We believe that God has entrusted to the church the message of reconciliation and that the church is called to proclaim and embody this reconciliation, to be peacemakers and to believe and to witness that God conquers all powers of sin and death, of hate, bitterness, and enmity through the life-giving word and spirit. We praise God that the gospel does not separate people on the basis of race, gender, class, or culture, but is the power of reconciliation in Christ. Because the church belongs to God, we be believe it must stand where God stands, against injustice and with those who are wrong. So, we commit ourselves to reject all forms of injustice within us and amongst us, and to struggle against all forms of injustice and every teaching that allows injustice to flourish, and to do this even if punishment and suffering may be the consequence. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Friends, I invite you then now to join, as you're able, in the hymn, How Can We Cry for Justice? It is a new hymn, the words are unfamiliar, but it is to the tune King's Bold, which is a familiar tune, and will be led by Dale Succo from our choir. 